Hello and welcome to SSON's executive webinar series. My name is Barbara Hodge. I'm the editor of SSON and I'm really delighted to introduce today's session on creating a digital workforce with robotic process automation. This session will share insights on a real-world case study by way of global transport and logistics company, DSV. Henrik Olsen is head of business architecture at DSV and will explain how to use RPA to complement traditional process automation technologies, how businesses are finding new ways to use RPA beyond what was initially planned, and how to evaluate real process change in conjunction with RPA. Henrik will also address the order to cash process where good customer interaction is key to success and where he has a lot of good news to share. Henrik has worked in forwarding and logistics since 1997 in various positions across the business and IT. He's currently in the global IT organization heading up business architecture with a focus on mobility, robotics, application consolidations, and ensuring that the business gets what it needs to continue its growth. Joining Henrik, I'm pleased to introduce Bill Galusha, who's the Senior Product Marketing Manager for COFAX RPA Products and Solutions. Bill is responsible for the COFAX Kapow Robotic Process Automation Software Platform. He has more than 15 years of product management experience and lots of different software products and solutions. Prior to joining COFAX, Bill spent seven years at EMC on the EMC Capture, BPM, and Case Management Products and Solutions. Now, before I hand over to Bill, I'd like to remind all of you that this is a live and very much an interactive session and encourage you to ask any questions you have throughout the presentation. We're putting aside time at the end of the presentation to make sure that we can address as many questions as possible. Any questions we do not address, please rest assured that we will share with the presenters and email responses will be sent to you. All right, with that said, Bill, I'm happy to hand over to you. Great. Thank you. And welcome, everyone. Um, as mentioned, my name is Bill Galush. I'm the uh, Product Marketing Manager for, uh, for COFAX, and I'm excited to be joined by Henrik Olson from uh, DSV uh, to provide his perspective on robotic process automation and how he and his organization is currently using the COFAX Kapow robotic process automation software platform. Uh, he's going to talk about some great uh, examples in terms of uh, how they're using it today. and. What I would thought I'd do is kind of uh, set that set the uh, stage for his uh, part of the presentation and talk specifically about a few other um, use cases that we're seeing, um, as well as just kind of give you a brief introduction to the the Cofax Kapow uh, product. Um, I have a few short videos that uh, that run uh, in conjunction with the presentation, and I think that will help provide some context around um, what we're going to be talking about today. So. If you're just waking up today and attending this and you haven't heard about robotic process automation and what's going on, um, this is one exciting um, opportunity for, for not only for the, the organizations but also for vendors. Um, and it's, it's really, it truly is a, a, a revolution when it comes to robotic automation. Um, there's a lot of good things and, and, and other things being written about uh, the use of software robots. Uh, but certainly, I think it has a, a, a tremendous impact on, on, on businesses and organizations across many different industries. Um, and that's kind of what we want to talk to you about is it's just some specific use cases across different industries um, and how robots are being used. Um, often that's one of the first questions people ask is that, uh, you know, what are these software robots? Um, and, you know, how are companies using it? And what are the things should I be aware of? Um, as I put together a, a, a project, an initiative, um, where should we start? Um, you know, how do we put together a center of excellence? Who builds these robots? All of these questions. There's lots and lots of questions in terms of you know robotic process, robotic process automation, and how software robots can be used. And that's really what we want to talk to you about today. Um, what's really driving, I think, the the use of robots? Because when you think about robots and, and traditional means of um, automating business processes and doing integration between systems, is that there's this overarching universal challenge uh, across many organizations, across many different types of industries, where when you look at the kind of the landscape of all the applications you you enterprises use today, all the different data sources. So information that you may be pulling from external uh, sources like websites or web portals that you have to go out and log into and, and push and pull information from legacy systems 
Uh, if you look across industries like banking and insurance and, and other industries, there's lots of old systems that frankly aren't going away. Um, and the challenge really is, is how do you connect and, and integrate all these systems and, and automate the, the processes that pertain to the, the data that flows to your organization. Um, so it's not a new challenge. Um, it's certainly a challenge that's been around for years. Uh, and we've tried to tackle it in many, many, many different ways. And I think that's really what uh, robotics provides, is a new, fresh look of saying, I have these problems. Um, I've worked with IT in the past to try to connect and, and integrate these systems. We tried to use other traditional methods, um, ways of exchanging data, but it doesn't give us 100% coverage in terms of connecting all these systems and different data sources. And that's really what's driving the challenge. Um, from a business perspective, it's, it's all the manual work that, that uh, is the fallout when you have uh, all these systems and different data sources that are disconnected. And you probably heard the term swivel chair automation. And that's just another way of saying you have humans or, or individual employees that are kind of sitting in between all these different systems and, and applications and data sources and kind of swiveling from one application to the next, uh, whether that's a, an old legacy system or going out to a portal and logging in and grabbing some information and or looking up some information. Essentially, employees are performing all those repetitive type tasks or activities that are part of a, of a business process. And we'll talk about a few uh, specific uh, examples here in a second. So that really brings us to the R offering in terms of what COFAX provides from a robotic process automation offering. And that's the COFAX Kapow solution, which is a robotic process automation uh, software platform that it can automate virtually any type of business activity that involves users, involves data, and systems. So as we talk through in terms of robotic automation and the different types of robots, you can have robots that run in a back office in a completely unintended type environment where you're pushing and pulling information between systems and applications. And in other instances, you have users, or business users, that are interacting with these robots or initiating a a task which then a robot goes off and performs that task versus a human doing it. So Kapow allows organizations to, to do several different things. One, automate the acquisition and integration information. So going out to different sources and pulling in information. And that could be um, bits of information that are part of a key task within a business process, or it could be a large acquisition of information data. So going out to hundreds or thousands of of websites and portals and pulling that information in and, and, and aggregating it. And in that type of scenario, it might be information that is needed in order to drive decisions and insight into the business. The other aspect in terms of what Compile can do is create really a single view of many different data sources. So think of all the different applications, different data sources, um, and how that information is accessed today by, by a business user. What they're probably doing is logging into one system, looking up some information, going into another system, looking up some information. And a common scenario for that uh, is in, in, in a front office type uh, setting, like a customer call center or a customer service center. Um, and that's another area in which robots can be very, very useful to the business in, 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 in automating uh, the, 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 the integration of information from many different sources. Third being, it's really about automating process activities and tasks. So think of any type of action that is being performed by a user and is being done in a manual, repetitive way. Think of all those tasks, all those activities that have never been automated. And looking across all the other types of technologies out there, for example, like business process management, are we really going to apply BPM to, to, to automate those tasks and activities? Most likely not. Um, a lot of, one of the challenges with traditional approaches to, to, to automating business processes is the complexity uh, and the rollout and the support and the maintainability. And that's really what the beauty is behind Kapow, uh, is the ability to quickly build and design these robots very effectively and, and to solve these, these, these business problems um, very rapidly. So really what, when you break it all down, Kapow is transforming this data into valuable information. So being able to, to automate processes that are back office, front office, 
processes that are that are important to the experience that you're trying to create for your customers and partners. Um, and that's really what the Kapow robots are doing. The robots with Kapow can automate a, a host of uh, types of manual processes and, and, and activities involving many different uh, um, systems and data sources. And this is kind of where I want to show you a few quick video snippets that kind of show you that from the design perspective how you can quickly build a, a, a robot to connect into different applications and different data sources. So, so for example, let's just take you know websites and web portals. Here we're looking at the, the Kapow Designer. Um, it's building a robot up top. You can see it's building out the robot just like a user would do in terms of navigating an application like Amazon.com. Here's the results, a PDF we've downloaded. Um, Kapow can also extract data out of that PDF. And finally, we finish up with being able to schedule that robot. That's just one example. So if you think of the, the billion websites that are out there today, they're all different. Um, they're always changing. And one of the things with the Kapow robots is that they're very resilient to, to change. Um, so this could be a case where you're just going out to a handful of sites and collecting information. Um, or it could be a, any number, of hundreds or even thousands of sites where, you, where we've had customers build robots to go out and aggregate and collect information. And then these robots can be scheduled uh, to run at specific times during the day um, or can be invoked or initiated by another processor or by another user as well. The next example I'll show you here is really one of the common situations that we hear when it comes to automating processes is that a lot of our content comes in via email. So we have content that's, that's trapped within the, the body of the email, and maybe there's a PDF that's also attached or an Excel file that's attached to that email. So how do we automate that? Here we're taking a look at a, a robot that is being quickly built to connect to, to email. So again, you can see it's, it's logging in, entering the password, clicking, signing in, um, going through the, the, the information contained within the, the email. So that could be the subject line. It could be the body of the email as well as the, the attachment. Very simple robot. And you can see we built this robot. And, then, and for, for purpose of explaining how quickly these robots can be built, um, this one was built in less than 10 minutes, just like the previous one where we connected into a, a, a website, uh, Amazon.com specifically. Um, so you can see the power of quickly building these robots. Um, and so robots can be you know, very simple or they could be highly complex. So, um, but the, the point is, is that you know, you're, you're able to design these robots in such a way to automate any type of specific activity or task that an individual user is doing. So you imagine trying to build this you know, writing code or using another integration type platform, there's a lot of things that you have to go through in order to, to achieve this. Um, and chances are you're not going to build it in 10 minutes. Um, so that's it's a really a key point to, to make here. The last one I show, I'll show you is, is really dealing with legacy systems. So think mainframe, old green screen applications. Um, in this particular robot, robot, or robot, it gets a little bit you know, it gets more complicated in terms of the process we're automating here. It involves email, involves a legacy system. Uh, it could involve going out to a portal. And this is really important because often you'll see, you know, another tool being used, uh, another RPA tool, and they'll show you this nice uh, way of recording a, a robot. And they only show with one application. Uh, but what if you had email, a legacy green screen application going out to uh, you know, di different portals, um, how would you build that? Uh, and that's really where I think the power of Kapow really shows off is that what we're showing here is building a robot, logging into a portal, extracting data from um, Excel. Uh, and this actually shows one part of another process, and I'll show you another one here in a second. But this particular one is an example of going out to a, a portal, uh, logging in, extracting information, pulling down a purchase order, uh, and then going through this purchase order, which is, in an, which is an Excel file, and then going line by line to extract the information. Uh, and then that information could be then pushed into um, an internal 
um, system, like your uh, like an SAP and or an, an Oracle uh, financial system as well. You can see again this this robot was built in 15 minutes. So the final one I'll show you now is this, the legacy uh, green screen application one. So let me go ahead and run this one. So here you can see the robot's been built. We're just clicking through it. Uh, one of the nice things with Kapow is I can quickly test and debug this uh, robot. So I'm clicking through. It's showing the green screen. Um, I can extract and I get push data. Here we're logging into email. So an example of, you know, it's not just building a robot that connects into your, your mainframe system, but also um, it's also pulling data um, from email. Uh, and it also could be going out to to a web portal. So you can see the the we can string together many multiple applications and different data sources together within one single robot as well. So that kind of gives you the pers perspective in terms of you know our product as well as you know robotic process automation. A lot of times when I present on RPA, those who are not real familiar with it don't have a clear picture understanding in terms of how these robots work. But really, what you saw there is a robot that's being built and designed to, to mimic the actions of the user, as well as allowing the, the robot designer to then apply uh, more complex business rules and logic. So everything from uh, transforming the data into a certain format to, to applying certain conditions and exceptions within, within the process flow. Now there are many use cases for RPA, and the way we've kind of broken it down here is to show you how these these bots are being used. In one one situation, you could use real robots to go out and collect data. Um, we see this a lot across banking, uh, information and services providers, retail, travel, and really any uh, company that requires the need to go out to to different sites and, and portals to to pull in pull in information. The other area is just really around what we'll call process bots, and this is focused on some of the manual business activities and tasks that I touched on. Um, you see a lot of this within being used within banking, so in the case of like um, mortgage lending, um, doing reporting, uh, customer service call centers, uh, onboarding a new client, and I'll talk specifically about that uh, particular use case here in a, in a minute. Um, and then. Uh, Henrik will talk more about logistics, which is a, an area where, um, where we see a lot of use for, of, uh, of uh, software robots. Um, and then certainly in the back office, across industry, finance and accounting, sales operations. Uh, in fact, we use, uh, Kofax uses Kapal across many different uh, departments um, um, within, within finance and accounting and, and sales operations as well. So let's talk about a few examples um, in terms of how robots can fill the gaps um, where automation, other process automation um, platforms fall short. And you know, to kind of mix things up, and you know, Henrik will talk specifically about transportation logistics, I'm going to focus in on banking because this is one area that we've worked with several, several different banks to implement Kapow for a few different uh, types of use cases. And I want to talk a little bit about a couple of those. So you think in terms of banks today, um, you have systems of engagement and systems of record. And systems of engagement are really the systems that your customers um, uh, are, are engaging with. And that could be mobile, that could be over the internet, uh, through a portal or a website. Um, and then you have your systems of record, which in some cases are older systems. So how do you connect these different systems together? And that's really where one of the uh, the, where things tend to break down in terms of the flow of information. Um, and being, being that in banking and insurance and, and, and quite frankly across all industries, creating a, a customer experience that, allow, that allows customers to have a, a, an engaging experience and wanting to come back and do more business with you is, is the environment that uh, organizations are trying to create today. So let's take, for example, mortgage lending. And this is a, uh, a bank in Denmark that's been using uh, Kapow for, for, for a couple years now. Um, and this is a great example of a system and engagement versus a system of record. The system of record is a file net um, content management, um, case management system that they have today that really runs their, their mortgage lending uh, process for, in terms of managing content and processing content related to a, a loan. And then they have a system engagement, which actually turns out to be a third-party portal that they don't control. 
Um, and that's really where the initial loan application data is filled out by the consumer and then submitted to the bank. Uh, before using robots, it was done in a very um, manual way in terms of getting information from this, this third-party portal into their FileNet system. So now they have robots that go out and automatically log into the portal at a specific time during the day or periodically uh, throughout the day. They get extracts the data, performs the checks, and then delivers that information into their internal system. So what they like to talk about is how they took the loan offer from 14 days down to 14 minutes. Um, so creating great efficiency um, within their, their lending process and a great customer experience uh, by using software robots. The other example that I'll touch on here, and, and before I hand it over to Henrik, is, is really around customer onboarding. So one of the uh, challenges within, within the banking industry is a lot of new regulations and, and processes that have to be applied. Um, one of those areas is around know your customer um, in, in anti-money laundering and, and CDD or customer due diligence. There's lots of requirements in terms of um, how that information needs to be collected, how it needs to be reviewed um, before you can onboard a new client. Um, and this could be a consumer, but this also could be a business that a bank is, going, is, is looking to do business with. Um, the challenge is, is the gen this re you know, one of the challenges is, is really getting access to the, inf the information that you need to collect. And a lot of times this information resides outside uh, the bank. Uh, and there's, there's sites that they have to go to in order to pull this information. And that really slows down the onboarding processes, creates a lot of inefficiency. Um, and what banks have traditionally done in recent years is hired more people, which is not an effective way. Um, and generally, these are highly skilled, highly paid people, more, more of the, the, the analyst type person that are analyzing this information. So the last thing you want to do is have these analysts going out and collecting information. So we've actually done this particular use case and implemented in a, a couple different banks recently. And if you take, you know, for example, you know, one of the data points that, they, that we've seen here is what, it, what used to take uh, two hours to, to handle in terms of each case when they're doing her, their whole customer due diligence, now can be done in two minutes. So you have robots that are going out and, and collecting this information from, from, from different internal and external uh, systems, uh, web portals and websites, um, information pertaining to you know, who this business is, uh, who do they do business with, um, you know, transactional information that they're pulling in, and it essentially pulls it into a case file. Uh, using these, these software robots so that you can have your analysts analyze the information and, and make a quick decision on is this a business or is this a, a, a consumer that we want to be doing business with? Are they on some watch list that we need to be aware of? Um, so you have the, the time savings, you have the better customer experience, you have the, 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 the less of a risk that you missed information because you're now collecting a large, vast, vast amount of more information uh, than you ever would would have done before, uh, and so you're talking about a very uh, very streamlined process. So the final thing is really that you know the Kapow robots can also be used in the the broader context uh, of a business process. So one of the things that we often see too is is that when we talk about the use of Kapow ro robots and the use of robotic process automation, is the ingestion of digital content. Um, so there's certainly one of the things, the consideration in terms of as you look at R RPA is what other capabilities do I need uh, or potentially need in order to, to augment and complement the, these robots? Do I need to ingest um, content from different channels? And that could be mobile, that could be email, it could be through over the internet, many different ways. Do I need to communicate with my customers, right? Um, and, and communicate in such a way that it creates an engaging uh, experience for my customers. So these are some of the things to consider in terms of when you look at, you know, uh, other potential uh, requirements and capabilities to consider how these robots are going to be used and what other complementary technology might be important. And this is something that the the, the platform provides uh, as well. So. I'll just wrap up here on the, in terms of the really the differences and one of the questions that we, we often get is is there's so many offerings in the market today and you know how how is yours different and what should I consider and 
Henry really can talk to some of these key points, but it, one of the things is 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 when we talk about RPA, you're going to find that you have some some products that are desktop, where robots are deployed to the desktops, and, and other products that are more designed around centralized server architecture. And that's really one of the unique differences for Kapow is that I design robots, I publish them to the server, I centrally manage them on the server, um, and these robots. Uh, can run and execute in parallel on, on the server. Uh, the only time we need to access a, a remote desktop or a virtualized desktop environment is in the case of a desktop application like a, like a thick client application like SAP or Oracle Financials. Um, in the case of, uh, in case of uh, a web robot, we actually run the, the robots on a centralized server uh, in parallel. does not require a, a web browser. Um, given we have an, an engine built directly in. And the same can be applied to uh, um, terminal screen uh, integration where, where we have native connectivity as well. Um, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Henrik and allow him to talk specifically about you know, his experiences um, with robotics um, and share some of his insights. So Henrik, it's all yours. Thank you, Bill. And uh, let's uh, let's keep it up uh, up to speed on that one. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what I call the pain uh, of manual processes, and and then the gain of uh, of the robotics in 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 that respect. So so uh, so this is my my key takeaway for for that one. Um, if you uh, go next slide, please, Bill. So, who am I? I have a really really good introduction to the beginning of this webinar, but in principle. Uh, I'm responsible for the business architecture, uh, and that's also a part where I basically took in uh, the uh, the robotics into DSV a, a couple of years ago because we saw that we we need to do something, especially uh, with with uh, with the changes we see towards our customers. Uh, so so this is uh, this is the key takeaway from 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 this uh, session as well. Um, next slide, please, Paul. So. Next 15 minutes, uh, we'll talk a little bit about DSV. Uh, we'll see what is the pain, and we'll also see a little bit about the gain, and then I'll talk uh, a little bit about the the, the conclusions or, or the key takeaway from uh, from from that one, basically. So, what does DSV actually do? We are uh, basically um, uh, next slide, please, Will. Uh, the fourth biggest um, freight forwarding company in the world. Uh, we made an a merger and acquisition a year ago with a company, a US-based company called UTI, where we doubled the size. Um, and this is also where we basically need to have uh, quite a big uh, amount of uh, applications that need to, to talk together and need to uh, consolidate them, which is also a part of the task. And this is also where we see that by, by doubling our size, uh, we need to also be more efficient in, in our processes. We are 44,000 people uh, worldwide. We have three divisions. Uh, it's a road division, it's Air and Sea, and it's a solution who does the warehousing part. Equipment-wise, uh, in Europe, I have uh, 17,000 trucks uh, on the road every day, um, and also a, a bunch of trailers, basically, uh, and and also presence in the U.S. So these are the back. Uh, these are the back and the reasons for actually doing uh, some robotics uh, in, in, in DSV because all these uh, implies to around 4 million bookings uh, a month uh, and those bookings are of course coming in automatically but uh, um, a large part of it even though we focus on automation and, and e-booking, EDI and so forth a large part still because of the vast number is still coming in manual and this is where we see the change in, uh, in the world so uh, let's continue <coughs> So the pain of the manual process um, um, is actually a focus where we need to do, uh, we, we need to meet the customer demands uh, and at the same time be very much efficient. Um, so we have made four areas where we need to, to be, uh, be competitive. Uh, and that is simplifying the way we do. Uh, we need to be more paperless. Um, uh, we do produce a lot of paper in, in, in uh, in our in our value chain uh, and also in, in in the part that we're actually receiving from the customers and that is uh, that's why paperless is there then we need to increase the quality uh, that we need to have and then we actually need to create value towards our customer 
uh, to be that, then we need to, to be more efficient and, and spend less time on all these administrative tasks uh, on, on that part. And now the next slide will actually show a little bit of what, what I mean about that. It is basically that more of our customers is demanding a custom solution to their needs, but they all want different methods. There is no standards out there. Um, so when you're coming up with, with areas that doesn't have an EDI solution, uh, we see that more and more customers, they don't want to uh, struggle with EDI with, with multiple vendors. Uh, so they uh, go into to a broker or a B2B portal where they say, if you want to do business with us, then uh, basically you need to connect to that. Um, they typically do not offer uh, any integration points. Um, so, so in that respect, I need to basically work manually. Um, uh, and that is something uh, we, of course, do because we want the customer. But it, it demands a lot of manual work. And this is the key point of uh, robotics for, for DSV and the use case to begin with. That was actually how to, uh, how to avoid being manual work in, in, in that part of the, of the, of the world chain. So customers that doesn't do this uh, is actually also difficult to have uh, APIs or EDI into our legacy systems. We have a huge EDI team uh, that does the EDI whenever we, we, we can do it, but there is a, a big amount of uh, customers where we're not able to do uh, um, uh, EDI or have APIs in that one. So I need a, a, a supplementary uh, for EDI setup uh, that basically can, can, uh, can get my time to market down uh, in, in onboarding new customers and servicing new customer with uh, the right one. So the reason we do this is, uh, is on the next slide where you can see um, that we get a lot of different methods where they're coming in. We see uh, emails coming in with things in the subject. We saw a, a web portal coming in. Um, we also see um, um, a traditional uh, PDF coming in, an Excel sheet that has been transformed into a PDF. And these are the things that we, we struggle with every day. Uh, and this takes a person's uh, uh, a person's job actually to do this and, and our business case to begin with our proof of concept which is something I, I, I clearly uh, use a lot also uh, also still when starting up is actually to prove that this is uh, this is good so from a department that uh, has a key account uh, responsibilities of uh, of receiving those we made four robots that that services four big customers doing portals, uh, mainly portals and, uh, and emails. Uh, and by, by using robots with that, we actually release time for, for two uh, full-time uh, employees uh, that actually uh, could use uh, their time for something else and then sitting on creating orders. And the good thing about using robotics is that whenever I get the mail or I get the, the, the visual coming in, um, I, can, I can lean back, basically let the robot run and execute and reply to the customer that we have received the booking much faster than a human will do. So I get actually give my customer a better quality uh, to, towards giving them reply back that yes, we have received your booking, uh, everything is, is ready, we'll, we'll contact you uh, when it's time for pickup. So, so that, is, uh, that is some of the most important things as well that we actually can give, uh, give our customers a better quality. A little bit about the reason for it. Uh, on the next slide, it is, uh, it is uh, clear why we need to do it. Uh, the transportation or logistic business is, 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 very, uh, is very having a low gross profit, uh, so we need to optimize. We cannot ask uh, for, for, for higher prices to our customers. Actually, the opposite, they want lower prices. Uh, the hauliers that we, we use, uh, they want higher prices because of uh, higher costs and fuel and so forth. Even though the fuel is cheap, they still want the higher prices. So the only thing we can do to increase and protect our gross profit level, uh, which, uh, which is around uh, 4%, which is quite good uh, in, in, in the logistic or transportation market, uh, it actually is to optimize uh, and be more efficient in our own processes internally. So this is where we basically protect our gross profit, is to keep optimizing uh, the way we, up, uh, we do and, and the focus is, uh, to begin with, of, of using robotics was the auto management part, uh, because there were some very, uh, very um, easily low-hanging fruits there that we just could pick and, and basically get off the start uh, quite fast. Uh, the two FTE we saved on the four robots, that was done uh, in, in a co-work with two employees of, of DSV and world consultants uh, that actually works uh, on, on the solution, very agile, 
and, and they basically had this proof of concept uh, in the first robot without any knowledge to begin with. The first robot was up, up and running within a week uh, where we did it uh, in a training and uh, the, the three other robots, they, uh, they, came, uh, they came continuously uh, after that period. So within uh, a month or so, they actually have four robots up and running that actually uh, uh, still runs today, so so that's uh, that's that's superb. So the next slide is actually where we're moving into the gains of robotics. We have talked a little bit about it, and I have four bullets on on the next slide again, where you can see that that what is it actually that we did uh, to succeed with with kill uh, kill manual time consuming processes it is that we we had focused on creating a team of local experts, uh, and then we trained them. Uh, we started up uh, with the assumption that we can do uh, localized training. Uh, and decentralized. So we want to detest them from, from our global IT so they wouldn't be, be uh, forced into, uh, into the IT project and prioritization where typically these things are, are not getting approved. Uh, so we want to localize it. So today I have uh, around uh, 25 people around the world that actually can work in, 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 in robotics and design them themselves and they are, uh, they are experienced business users with, with a slight touch of uh, of uh, interest from IT and knowledge from IT. And then we made a, a Kapow forum where they can share the knowledge and uh, one of the questions that we actually got during uh, Bill's uh, presentation was, can you reuse the robots? And yes, you actually can reuse the robot. That's why we have this Kapow forum. So, so what we have is, for example, a login to, uh, to Outlook Webmail. Uh, that part of the robot is, is reusable. It's just, different, uh, it's just different user credentials. We also have uh, a, um, a robot that feeds our EDI platform uh, with bookings, and that's also reusable. So we use uh, to create uh, central robots that actually can be reused by others, and that's why a power form is, is very much needed to share the knowledge. It's still uh, governed by IT, uh, because this is uh, very much in production and very much live and very much an enterprise uh, solution, so we need to, to be governed by IT. I'll get back to that in the end of the slides. Then we use the PUCs uh, and real life example uh, as the selling point and that's one of the key uh, experiences that we got. Um, the business know, actually know what they want um, but they are they're very much in doubt about the solution, about this robotics. So, so they basically is very much um, uh, very much into to, uh, to, to doing this but they are in doubt that robotics uh, can solve it. So they need to see it. So one of the, we created a lot of these small examples and videos, like uh, some of them, like you, you saw in the three you saw in Bill's presentation, and we used those, and then we built small robots. And 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 I can agree that yes, you can build robots fast, uh, but uh, not necessarily that fast as uh, as when they have to go to production as ten minutes. We typically say four hours for a simple robot. Then uh, it's up and running uh, um, from from a basically a step one. So if you move into the next slide, then uh, we can talk a little bit about where to attack it. Um, so the first one is actually that uh, in the tier one systems, um, we can see that these are the core systems. We will never touch them with uh, Kapow. They are EDI or XML service or API. They have high volumes coming in. Uh, we have uh, EDI platforms that handle this. This is also typically customers that is uh, having a low margin. I call them typically sausage factory. Uh, so it has just to produce fast and fast. I will never use Kapow for that. That we have our solution for. Then we have the tier two ones that is in the middle uh, where there is still good margins on it, uh, but they are not so interesting uh, because the, the number of them uh, is, is not is not necessarily there, and um, it's uh, it's still a lot of uh, uh, centralized things. If you should do it uh, with our enterprise solutions like EDI or, or, or ESPs, or we should use it for 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 um, for Kapow. So then there is the the the, the long tail, uh, basically uh, that is uh, tier three. This is the low volume customers that never uh, typically would do uh, would do. Um, will come out on the prioritization in, in the list for global IT and for the eyes. Uh, there's typically no integration from, from their sites because they are small and mid-size. Um, typically it's manual work, it's been sold. We're in a good money of them because they're high margin money, uh, but there is still a lot of manual processes. These are the low-handing fruits. This is where we decided to start uh, because the return of investments in them are, are basically instant. Um, we uh, we uh, will will turn them around in, in qu quite efficiently when we see them. Uh, we'll also start very very much in the small. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, you can see some examples again uh, summarized. 
So basically, these are the typical things, uh, as you see, and, and there was a good example on the video where you actually log into uh, Outlook webmails. Um, so we basically create a lot of webmails uh, accounts, uh, Outlook accounts, where they then basically send their mail, either in, in, in a clear text or in a, in a machine-generated PDF, or we use to log in on that. But this is where we started, because there are so many possibilities. And we needed to, to create a success in, in our company, create some success stories and some ambassadors who want to sell this and can see this is a good example. Because I can go out and sell it, but in principle, typically, uh, the business wants to have the business to tell them that something is working. Uh, they believe more uh, uh, to, to what the others in the business is doing. So if they have a good story, then they're really, really good to sell it. And this is why we, start, why we started in our key account department. So, so keep it simple. And, and do not, uh, in my world and the experience we have, don't try to solve the entire uh, process to begin with. Start by building small building blocks. Uh, trying to say, yeah, uh, but we could save X amount of hours of work if we do the entire process. But it takes longer time to do it. So, so get, get, get it simple. Get started simple. And then you'll get small successes. Uh, and, and, and then you'll basically be able to build on top of it again, making more experience and, and, and share it. So, so start in the simple. That is basically the, the, the best one to, to, uh, to look at this. And, and when I say simple, then on the next slide, uh, you can see um, how simple we, we actually talk about robotics. Uh, you saw the, the videos. They are simple. Uh, but uh, I have to say that the errors, as I mentioned earlier, uh, as the example, is, is four hours per robot of the simple robots, uh, where you basically log in, you extract some data, and you save some data, and you can then put it into uh, to to uh, to uh, to another system or save it in on Excel on a on a database or whatever you 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 have your use case for it. You do have a very minimal amount of coding. Uh, what you saw in the videos, they they that was actually the um, the developer screen uh, or the the, the the Kapow driver's uh, license, uh, where the user is actually creating it that has been on, on Kapow training. So they can do the drag and dropping and so forth, but it's also the place where you can do much more advanced stuff. And, and when we're talking much more advanced stuff, uh, this is where you're going to combine uh, what I use for what I call plumbing. You need to have them run much more uh, error, uh, error secure, and you need to build a lot of uh, um, self-sustained uh, uh, s uh, processes into the robot. This requires more. Uh, so if you use them for, for these things, then, then it requires more than four hours. And that's also why we said start with the simple ones. Uh, build some experience, build some good, uh, good histories that you can use, and then you can start using the more advanced stuff and making more and more of the supply chain uh, automated. But start by getting it uh, done simple. It's also important for DSV that we don't need to wait for other websites or our own IT department to actually start uh, integrating. So when I get a new customer coming in, as long as that customer can generate some kind of structured format for me, uh, then uh, we can start using Kapow as the onboarding uh, and wait until uh, our, uh, our two companies then uh, get the EDI or, or, or other electronic setup up and running. But I can basically receive that uh, and, and make it happen within uh, the same week uh, going from, uh, from, uh, from uh, development to production. And we, we have four environments uh, running. Uh, and we do that because we want to ensure that what we have it putting into production is, is, is secure, it's stable, uh, and it doesn't impact the other robots that we have running. Um, because the other robots, they, they have a purpose, and that purpose is basically to, to make, make the quality better, and it's also to uh, reduce the amount of manual work, hence saving, uh, saving FTEs. That is, uh, there's no doubt of, about that one. Then uh, it's uh, easy to configure and run them in parallel. Uh, as a logistic company, we have a rush hour uh, between uh, 2 and 4 o'clock every day, where all uh, customers want to book. Uh, they, of some kind, always wait until the last moment to book, uh, and that is in that area. So I need things to run in parallel. I cannot have things running in, in serial that it has to wait for each other. And this is one of the differentiators between uh, the vendor selection we did, uh, why we choose uh, Kapow, is that they can run in, in parallel. I can have as many robots as I want. It's basically a license issue, of course, but it's basically uh, 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 issue of how many CPUs and how many memory you put into the server. Uh, then it can run uh, 50 robots in parallel if you want that. And, and a lot of the other systems that we looked at couldn't do that. And, and this is uh, some of my main um, 
main t takeaways from, from, from doing this. And if you go to the last slide, please. So enterprise ready, this is, I have talked about a couple of times, is what do I mean about that? We have been looking out and, and a lot of the solutions out there, uh, and that's also one of the questions that, that pops in, uh, is that why we actually decided to, uh, to, to look at Kapow. Uh, it's actually because a lot of the other solutions are most of the other solutions that we're looking at that is highly rated in, 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 in some of the, the, the scoring that we have seen um, is actually not enterprise ready, uh, basically. They, they say they have a lot of things that they can do, but in, 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 all, in, all, uh, in my world, they are not enterprise ready because they don't have a server side. They're coming from desktops uh, worlds and trying to be uh, enterprise ready where, where actually this product here is actually coming from server side and our server side and moving into the desktop areas where needed uh, and and the other thing is that everything runs basically uh, within the server uh, when it's not the, a, a thick client so when we see the more and more things that we are connecting to is actually uh, internet portals and internet uh, enabled solutions then I can execute that within the server and do not have to have X amount of virtual servers uh, or, or desktops running uh, that my IT department needs to maintain. So every, t every time um, uh, the other solutions where I need to scale up, I need to scale up having more desktops to more uh, developers. Uh, so that works perfectly fine in a small scale. But when you're starting to grow uh, and you want to have it uh, global, uh, then it's going to be a nightmare uh, for, for the IT department to maintain that and also from the license part to, to ensure that it's, it's being uh, the licenses for all the applications and so forth is in use. So this is actually the the, the quite important part of the uh, the business case. It may look very very good from the business side, but it doesn't necessarily look good when you look at overall uh, on, on on that part. Um, there's just coming in a question about the resistance. Um, no, we have actually not seen it, it has a resistance. The question was that if we have experienced any resistance uh, among the staff because we are coming to automate them um, and replacing them, uh, basically. We are not replacing them. That's a, that's a big part of this change management we're actually running as well, that we're actually freeing them up so they can do more quality work uh, in, in, uh, in the business. So we are freeing them up to do manual, uh, manual labor work uh, that is boring, that is not necessarily what they want to do. And then we're freeing them up and giving them some more quality work uh, interaction with the customers, making sure that the, the customer service is, is much better uh, and being more proactive in that part. So, so we're trying to rescale them. That's one of the advances that we do. So when we implement this, we are not uh, coming in with a, we need to uh, automate your work uh, so when you're done, uh, goodbye uh, basically that's not how we're going in so together with this we're coming in with a change management exercise where we ensure that we are going to work with them and we also put them on a journey to do something else so so the the replacement issue we do not have seen that because we have the change management part is as well uh, so final conclusion is looking at it from a turn of investment point of view be careful only look at it from a business side. There is a huge IT side be, be beneath that and that can destroy the business case. And that's actually what we saw is that it would destroy the business case because it will demand so much more work from our IT department. Uh, and we also have in, in our network, um, uh, when we're discussing robotics, uh, we see more and more companies actually changing toward more enterprise ready solutions uh, because of that issue. Um, so, so that's it. So that was a uh, 15 minutes short uh, from my side, um, and uh, yeah, over to you, Bill. Great, thank you, Henrik, and thank you for sharing your insight. Hopefully, um, I'm sure the audience got uh, a lot out of the information and a lot of the questions that I often hear around robotics. I think you, you've answered. Um, the, in terms of more information, uh, creating a digital workforce, which is the topic of today's uh, webinar and sharing with you some of the use cases and hearing from Henrik in terms of how they approached uh, robotics and rolled it out, um, you can go to cofax.com. Uh, there's more, certainly more information out there um, that speaks and talks about uh, RPA generally and as well as our, our, our product offerings. Um, I think we're going to take some question and answers. I know there was one question that came in I saw that uh, you answered, Henrik, but um, let's see, Bar Barbara, can we see if we have any questions that came in? Absolutely, Bill. Thank you. And just a reminder to everyone online now, please do send your questions through. We've obviously got some time left to address these. Um, let's start with this one. Um, 
question to Bill. Bill, the interface that you shared during the video demonstration, was that the developer or the end user view? That's the design studio, so it's the Kapow designer, um, which is when you look at uh, robotics or robotic process automation, that really is the central to to the products in the market. Um, the um, Kapow also provides what we have. We these we can also build these small micro applications that we call caplets that can actually be. Uh, enable a, a business user to, to say, input data and kick off a robot or pull data in from a robot that uh, had executed. Um, so that's a good question. So what we were looking at was the design studio, and that would be the robot designer, um, typically a business analyst, and in some cases a developer working in that, um, that um, environment. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, next question, let's address this to Henrik. <coughs> Sorry. Henrik, what sorts of criteria did you have when you were evaluating the different robotics products? We uh, definitely uh, we looked at, at, at the flexibility of the product. Uh, we also, as, as, as a fairly large company, we, we also looked at what would it look like if this was going to be a success uh, in, in the business, so so being widely spread uh, about, uh, uh, around time zones and, and geographicals as well. Um, so so these were one of the important criteria. So so the ease of work and actually uh, in a long discussion with uh, with uh, with Kapow on saying that if we're going to sign this contract, you need to have certain things ready. They need to have some some focus on working in Excel uh, because our end users, uh, our experienced people who's using scripting today, different kinds of scripting and macros and so forth, uh, they, they, they are not used to working with databases. So they are working with, with Excel sheets. So we need the Kapow product to be more, uh, more efficient on, on that part, and they, they evolved that. And we also said to them, yeah, we still have some legacy systems, and we still have some desktop things, so we also need to move it that way. And that's also come. So they, they were some of the demands that we're putting in, uh, and, they, and, and, and actually you can see that within uh, within a, a year cycle, we're actually getting the things out of it. So, so don't look at the short-term sites and the POC and say, yeah, this, is, this, is, uh, this looks good, uh, but, but look at it on, on um, um, look at it on, on if it's going to be a success, uh, how can you manage that success, basically, and that's a, a big issue. Thank you, Henrik. Maybe I could follow up with a question here. Um, how difficult was it to integrate Kapow in the existing IT landscape? And how do the enterprise-ready systems reduce the IT costs? Is there a different model where each robot does not need to link to a different virtual machine? Sorry, I'm not sure the question makes yeah. sense, but I think, yeah. yeah? Exactly. So, so in principle, if I take the first question about the, how easy it was, um, it, it, from a Kapow point of view, it's, 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 it was easy. Uh, it's actually the host systems uh, that actually get the chance, but uh, by one of the the things that we also uh, required was that in the proof of concept that the blue screen should work because we have some legacy system using blue screens and and we didn't want to use uh, time to develop uh, logic and 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 data uh, data logic in putting it in uh, via um, via a database or an API. Uh, so, so basically, we want to, to put it in uh, via the program's logic, because then we didn't, then, then the, the time to market was faster, and, and the robot will are forced to obey the rules of the application. So, so these are the plumbing that we used. Uh, so that was actually quite, uh, quite easy, and, and, and you saw in the small video that, uh, that the blue screen work is, is actually working. And, and that works without a desktop. It's working embedded in, in the server, actually. And that's actually uh, very, very uh, good. Um, um, what was the other question uh, again? Uh, the um, sorry, let me just see where we were there. Yeah, if I can add to that uh, question about the virtual machines, and that's a common question that comes up. So if you look at a lot of the RPA products in the market, a lot of, as Henrik mentioned, have come from the desktop. So they actually build the robot. Um, and then deploy it to a desktop. We actually deploy ours to the server, so it executes on the server. And if you take the web robot I showed you as an example, um, we have an embedded browser engine. So I, it doesn't require us to go connect to a virtual desktop in order to access and launch Internet Explorer. Um, so that allows us to completely eliminate dozens or potentially hundreds of VMs, virtualized desktop environments, um, from having to be set up. 
um, the robots are run in parallel on the server. Um, the same type of scenario is, is also uh, the case with the uh, terminal, green screen applications, much like what I just showed you. Um, the only time you need a virtualized desktop is if I have to, say, connect to an older SAP system, Oracle Financials, or maybe some other client server application that resides on the desktop. So, so from a deployment Bill, 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 maintainability, Bill. yes. Yeah, Bill, just just a comment on that, and 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 it's fairly when we evaluated that, uh, that was actually one of the questions that we had. Uh, how do we we do that? Because we already uh, that's a big issue, but but that's actually what we found out is 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 exactly the same for for most of uh, for all the vendors. They need to have an old sub thick client. They need to have a desktop, but th there is a difference between how many desktop they need per. Uh, per employee that is actually developing this. So, so in this case, we can just add in the desktop that is needed, uh, and and then let Compile control the connection to that, and not necessarily uh, have one for each uh, each desktop or each user uh, coming in. And this is where the differences in the enterprise makes it uh, how many of those you need to maintain and update, ensuring that uh, it's, it's, it's being updated by the Microsoft uh, monthly update and so forth. And this is where it it, it, it puts down the, the, the business case by hosting those machines, both from a licenses and maintenance point of view. Thank you. And I think, Henrik, you actually did answer the second part of the initial question, uh, which was about the IT costs. Um, let, me, let me address this question. Uh, it's to Henrik. You didn't say much on establishing RPA governance standards as you launched the capability globally. I'm assuming you did that work in establishing standards. Agree? Yes, uh, it was not the focus of this presentation of, of, of the short uh, amount of time we have. Uh, we specifically had a huge focus on the governance and the standards on, on what we did, especially because uh, I, I wanted to have this decentralized from the central IT department, uh, but still keeping the central IT department in control with what they're putting into production. So they are the gatekeepers between our pre-production environment and our production environment. But users are able to develop themselves and, and put them into a, a, a QA environment doing testing, and then it has to run through this gatekeeper function uh, to ensuring that it, it's being, being created correctly, and, and, and if there is some coding uh, done, that that code is, 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 is verified as well. So when it comes into the production server, uh, they, actually, um, they actually are, are, are running smoothly and don't impact the, the overall performance of, of the other robots. And that's why I mean that this kind of work is, is, is important when you're running it as an enterprise, that, that the more robots you put in, the more success this is having, uh, the more dangerous it is when things go down. And this is IT, it will go down. Uh, so you also need to have a good uh, governance and a good uh, support uh, manual and SLA around this. When it goes down, what do you do? What is the expectations on that? So yes, we did have that fully uh, aware, and that's why we have four environments uh, that we can use, and we have uh, fallback plans and, and, and those things. And the overall responsibility for the, the robots is, is, is from the developers uh, that we have educated, uh, but keeping the, the servers up and running uh, in, overall, that is global IT. So yes, governance uh, is, is hugely important uh, in, in this part. Thank you so much, Henrik and Bill. Uh, I'm afraid we are at the top of our hour. We have tons of more questions, but I am going to forward those questions to both of you and would ask that we then relay some answers back to the individuals. So my apologies to everyone, my apologies to everyone whose questions we did not get around to today. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Kofax and Bill Delusha very much for this session and of course Henrik Olsen, thank you so much for sharing some insights on DSV, really impressive case study. To everyone else who's logged in, thank you. Please do log back in in uh, half an hour's time when we're going to be having our next session today and don't forget to check www.rpaworldseries.com for the rest of the schedule this week. Thank you very much to everyone involved. This concludes this webinar.